some months ago, I don't know when it was exactly, right a year ago, a year ago that when I saw, first saw this, uh, I experienced, Lewis and I experienced a webinar that Rosemary Joyce, our, our uh, presenter today, uh, presented. And we both really thought it would be useful, a webinar was at, uh, for AAA, uh, but we thought it would be really useful for this organization in particular because SHA is as uh, in an ongoing effort <laughs> to find ways to um, to dismantle res white privilege, dis uh, resist racism, develop anti-racism sorts of strategies, call it what you will. The SHA is really, and it's supported by the board in a long-term effort to to uh, increase the organization's sensitivity to these issues. Uh, many of you know that we had a anti-racism training yesterday, which, which many of us were not able to attend, but some several of us were, and I understand it went very well. We hope to reprise that if possible in, uh, in our Washington meetings. And so a part of the piece, of course, is to look at under, underrepresented min minorities in anthropology programs, because one of the Gender Minority Affairs Committees, Flory Bulgarin, our chair, is here with us today. Um, and the, that committee of the SHA is very, very invested in finding strategies to accomplish these goals. But it is a long-term effort, and it takes a lot of work, and it takes a lot of reflection, and uh, and a lot of financial commitment. Um, I'm going to publicly thank Chris Fennell for making the uh, the training yesterday possible, for finding funding for that which we would not have been able to do if he had not located funding. So it takes, um, as Hillary says, it takes a village, or someone said that. Anyway, but I do think that, um, that this is part of it. So I will, what we're going to do is Royce Royce gonna, uh, has very kindly reframed her presentation that she gave uh, in a AAA context for the SHA. Um, and uh, we will then just discuss and exchange some ideas. We anticipate something very casual. We do have panelists that are going to speak briefly to who they are and how they intersect with these issues very briefly. And then, regardless of how large the room, the, uh, the attendance is, we want to have an open discussion. Okay? So, without further ado, Rosemary yeah. Joyce. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I found that David, yeah. by the way. I saw it. So, there are two things I want to um, say at the outset. The first is that. Uh, Looking in the room, the, what always happens in situations like this is the people who come are the people who don't need this information, which is why I'm going to go through it quicker. Um, I understand that this session is being taped and will somehow be hooked up to the SHA blog. Um, the AAA webinar is also available on the AAA website. And what I would encourage everybody to do is go back and force your colleagues, um, especially those of you who are faculty, to review this information. Because I do think that what we need to do is get the people who won't show up in a room like this for one reason or another to pay attention. And the second thing I want to say is, why am I doing this particular thing? Um, I am obviously an archaeology faculty member at Berkeley in the anthropology department. Um, we have worked assiduously and I think quite successfully, about 20 to 25 percent of our doctoral program students uh, represent our underrepresented minorities according to the federal definitions, which is why I'm using that language, because that's the language through which we can keep track. But I want to underline that we did that in a state that has a law on the books that doesn't allow us to consider race or ethnicity as one of the criteria in admissions. Okay? So we did it from the worst possible place. And we did it as part of a university-wide effort which I, as for the last four years, as Associate Dean of the Graduate Division, have been intimately involved in to try to actually figure out how in this legislative atmosphere can we keep the University of California from losing what, in fact, are not acceptable numbers of underrepresented minority students and, in fact, try and gain so that we are the university we need to be in the most diverse state in the union in the future. So that's sort of why this is on my mind or why this is even an issue that I think I have some, some uh, basis to talk about. And it isn't rocket science. Everything I'm going to say is going to seem really, really straightforward. But even though it's not rocket science, there are some implications of what we all know that I think provide the grounds for what we should do. Um, in addition to the webinar, I was part at the last AAA of a session that was uh, talking about how do we actually solve these problems. 
And it was astonishing how many people didn't know about some of the things I'll talk about. So there'll be a, come a point where I'll ask you if you've ever heard about certain programs. So um, we need to think about this as a long-term thing about recruitment, retention in the doctoral program, completion of the doctoral program in a timely fashion, because national data show if you do not complete the PhD in under eight years, in the social sciences and in anthropology specifically, you have a much lower, statistically lower, likelihood of getting a tenure track job. Now, there are plenty of multiple careers that especially the archaeologists go into, but we will not change the academy if we do not get those students who are underrepresented minorities completed in a timely fashion so that hiring committees cannot discriminate against them on the basis of their time to degree. That's a really important point. Um, we also need to think, although this particular webinar doesn't go into it, about that transition point after the PhD. Uh, Berkeley, the Graduate Division at Berkeley did a 40-year retrospective uh, alumni survey looking at careers, and I and my program have now replicated this for the archaeology program at Berkeley going back 20 years since I came there 20 years ago. And both of those surveys, both the survey and my data show that it is normative now in anthropological archaeology to have a period of continuing apprenticeship of two to three years after obtaining the PhD before most people, 80% of the people who get uh, in tenure track jobs start out first with two or three years of something else. And so it's incumbent on us in this pipeline to think about how to get people through that apprenticeship period so they don't fall off the pipeline. How do you make certain that during those two to three years, people are improving their profile for hiring, publishing, doing some teaching? And that might be using adjunct lecturing opportunities in a mindful fashion. That might be helping somebody get a non-academic job that isn't so impoverishing that they can still, on the weekend, finish that article. But we can't just say, you got your PhD, that's fine, because that's another place that we're losing our diversity. So we need to develop a pipeline to graduate education. To get students in, we need to practice what we call comprehensive admissions review at Berkeley. And we need to establish clear benchmarks of progress for our students so that they finish in a timely fashion. And those are not things that universally are being done well in the US. Now let's frame this a little bit with the numbers. This is the main reason I needed the PowerPoint, because I can't do the numbers, OK? Um, this is uh, derived from the National Science Foundation. And so the breakdown of ethnicity is their breakdown. And basically, you have science and engineering occupations, the percentages in those occupations, science and enge engineering degree holders, college degree holders, and then the total US population. Now, when you look at this, this is for all science and engineering. You can already see that there's some real issues with proportionality. If you just start with the total US residential population, we all know that, um, that uh, certain, you know, the white population, basically the difference between 71.8 and 67.6 is statistically negligible. But if you look at the black population, 11.7 of the total US residential population, 3.9 of those employed in science and engineering fields, 5.5% of those with degrees, 7.2 with college education. What that is, that's attrition. That's a pattern that we have to deal with, and it's worse in our in anthropology. Now, I'm using anthropology even though we're talking about archaeology because in the United States, most people who are hired in, our, in archaeological positions got their degrees in anthropology. We have very few PhD granting programs that are branded as archaeology. So, and also the NSF doesn't collect data on um, just archaeology. If you look again, um, the S's are from the original data set. As it says, they're suppressed for reasons of confidentiality and or reliability. What that means is either the number was so small that including it would somehow potentially allow you to trace back to the individuals who answered the surveys. And you can figure out which ones those are. Or there are problems with the data categories. Asian is actually a problem with the data categories, how people are counted. Um, Hispanic actually has many of the same problems, but the census is not dealing with them. It just treats it as its own kind of entity. Um, and as a Latin Americanist, this is very much on my mind these days. Again, if you look at the numbers, 
our Latino student uh, uh, PhD holders in anthropology is quite good as a reflection of the general population, much better than the average for uh, science and engineering degree holders. But where we clearly are not doing our job is with African American students, and we're worse than the general science and engineering numbers. We're worse than the general science and engineering numbers. And this includes all those ethnographers as well. This isn't just the archaeologists. So this is not a number to be complacent about. This is a number to be ashamed about and to do something very proactive. Why is this the case? Well, it's not, again, a secret. We have a couple of actual reports. This one by Roberto Gonzalez was published in 2002 in the Anthropology News, and it's an analysis of the top 10 anthro departments looking at the proportions, just the proportions of graduate students and tenure track faculty, and found, again, that these are very small proportions. And that means that in any anthropology department, the likelihood of having mentors who understand the paths and difficulties you face and the microaggressions you face on a day-to-day -day basis is quite small. And what Roberto showed is that these numbers are quite stable for the highest ranked programs. They are not shifting. And coming from one of the highest ranked programs, having been chair of the Department of Anthropology at Berkeley, I can tell you that that is actually uh, a reflection of not outright overt discrimination, but the way that high status programs validate candidates, what counts. So um, 70 to 90 percent of the minority anthropologists receive their degrees at public institutions, and 70 to 90 percent of them are employed by public institutions. But even at high-ranking public institutions, there is a preference for graduates from private universities that are even highly ranked. So right away, if 70 to 90 percent of your pool of underrepresented minority PhDs come from institutions that institutionally aren't ranked as high, mm -hmm. you're going into a search and you're not discriminating against them on the basis of race. You're discriminating them on the basis of institution. Um, 25 to 40 percent of the minority anthropologists have their primary appointments and programs in departments outside of anthropology. Being interdisciplinary is not a good thing on the job market. Anybody who tells students otherwise is lying, and those of us who are interdisciplinary in our practice know this, because you're less intelligible. Your part of you that's over in some other field is read as somehow disloyal. People want to reproduce their discipline as they understand it. So that's not a good thing. Um, sorry, this, this comes from the 2010 report on the Commission on Race and Racism in Anthropology, by, which was done by Janice Hutchinson and, and Tom Patterson. And they did focus groups asking, again, these anthropology students and faculty, what is your experience and what, you know, what are the issues here? This number one, the numbers are the ranking of those comments. I'm not giving all the comments. You can go and read the whole thing. Everybody should read the whole thing. Your chairs of your departments should read the whole thing. You should bring it to their attention and ask them if they've read it. If you're tenured faculty in this room, especially I'm talking to you, we can be gadflies. We can say in faculty meetings, the 2010 report from the AAA, and we have to start doing this because goodwill has not changed this pattern. Number one, many departments devalue the kinds of research questions that minority students want to pursue. I want to go back to why are those highest ranking academic institutions not becoming more diverse? If you have a preference for theory over practice, if you have a preference for um, French theory over the application or community-engaged scholarship that is increasingly critical to anybody who works with descendant communities of any kind, then you are likely to read somebody's um, vitae who has invested a significant amount of work in working with descendant communities and working with the communities that they're part of as not scholarly in the way that high-ranking departments valorize. Now, as mentors of students, I would urge us all to help them figure out a way to represent their community-engaged scholarship in the most theoretical terms possible. I am a highly theoretical archaeologist. Um, that is a skill. You tell them what you are doing actually is about subjectivity. 
And the student of mine that I'm thinking of who resisted that when she was writing her dissertation now is writing about subjectivity in her postdoc year at her third year out, having finally understood why what I was saying about subjectivity is exactly what she's doing when she writes about communities that are dispossessed and outside of their homeland. Okay, We need to help our students speak two languages. Um, the rest of these are incredibly awful. Um, I'm not going to, again, belabor them. They reinforce. I want to go to the proposed best practices that came out of the focus groups. This is what these students and faculty said, do these things. And again, these are ranked by that group. Mentoring is not race specific. Students and faculty need to be mentored by a variety of people inside and outside the departments. Although I think we have an urgent problem with underrepresented minority students, we actually have a more pervasive problem with students. We do a terrible job in academia in helping doctoral students in particular grow. We still, the higher ranking the program, the more likely it is that we throw them into a, the water and, and even justify this in terms of this is part of what you have to learn to do for yourself. Well, that's great, but if we want to talk about students who have never Who's, no one in their family has ever gotten a college degree. How do you figure out what you have to do? You have no model for this. So it's cruel and it reproduces a certain kind of profile. Mentors need to be aware of the specificity of the needs of the students and faculty they mentor and of their own limitations as mentoring. So those two, if you put the two of them together, are saying there should be multiple mentors for people, for all people, and mentors need some structuring and support. Mentors need training in how to mentor. Um, mentors need resources about how to mentor. And there are resources out there. Uh, I run a program that trains graduate students to be good mentors to undergraduate students at Berkeley. Those same techniques are just as good for faculty to be good mentors for doctoral students. They include things, you know, we've all heard meet every week with your mentee. I'm not talking about that. That's a little bit like those grammar manuals that tell you how to use commas. I'm talking about um, make certain that there's clarity of goals. Keep in regular contact. Regular can be less than a once a week. Once a week can feel like surveillance. If you insist that somebody come to your office once a week and tell you what they've done for the last week, that can be too much. So you can, there's not a prescription. But if your person you're mentoring hasn't talked to you in a semester, that means you've lost them. Um, number five, develop something like a first generation support system that takes place during the summer to acclimate students. This is a structural one that universities need to do. They're called boot camps in a lot of the professional disciplines and sciences that already do them. They do them usually for all their students. That is, you don't single out some group of students and make them feel like they're less qualified. You say, we're going to bring you all here, but you include all the programming that would be necessary for somebody who comes from a family that has not been part of the university system before. And you will, by the way, help students who you will not have identified as needing this help. And make more efficient use of the Mellon program for minority students. So this is the participatory part. How many of you know about the Mellon Mays undergraduate program? Show of hands. One hand, two hands, four hands, five hands. Okay, Br Russ, you don't count. Um, four hands. Okay, so this is the thing that when we were doing this session at the AAAs also turned out to be wi widely unknown to anthropologists in attendance, which means that your faculty colleagues don't know about the Mellon Mays program. So you all need to go out and proselytize for the Mellon Mays program to them. So let's look at both of these. First, develop something like a first generation support system that takes place during the summer to acclimate students. And then I was supposed to actually do this. See, I was supposed to highlight the two, sorry. Okay, so this is the developing the pipeline to graduate education part. That was just setting up what's the problem, what do we have to do, what are the people who are suffering from the problem telling us we have to do. So how do we develop a pipeline? Um, partnerships with historically black colleges and universities and tribal colleges and universities are a completely clear and evident thing to do. That doesn't mean that um, they're easy to do. Developing a partnership actually means finding partners and working with them. Um, it doesn't mean just writing an email to somebody and saying Berkeley uh, welcomes your application. It means figuring out, is there a summer program you can do? And I'll talk about the University of California summer program. 
contact pipeline programs, the Mellon Mays, the McNair, and others on your campus. So my campus has something called the Haas Scholars. In other words, if you're trying to recruit people to your graduate program and get a more diverse pool, look at other universities from which you routinely get students and look at their websites and see if they have a Mellon Mays program, see if they have a McNair program, see if they have other kinds of research programs that are intended for students from traditionally underrepresented groups. And write to the coordinators of those programs with your name and say, tell your undergraduates they can write to me if they want to apply to my program. Tell your undergraduates they can write to me, not the university's anthro at berkeley.edu number that is completely anonymous, but to you, an actual human being, who they can look up first on the website and figure out who you are and get over the fear that you're a scary person because you've already invited them. Cold writing is really difficult for anybody. Um, these are programs that already are preparing students for success. So we shouldn't lose even one of these students from the pipeline. But they may not know who to apply to. They may apply to the wrong graduate program. And as we all know, getting into graduate school isn't just about being qualified. It's also about picking the graduate program that's right for you. And in 20 years of working with Berkeley undergraduates, this is the number one thing that I have found is that they ask each other what graduate schools they should apply to. It's the worst possible method in the world. And they all apply to the school that they heard that someone else got into. And then they're devastated when they don't get into it because they don't understand that it's not like being an undergraduate. That's the thing they've done successfully. Reach out to colleagues in sections of professional organizations to recruit undergraduates as graduates prospects. In the AAA version of this, I used the SHA's um, Black Arche Ar Historical Archaeologist section as an example. Um, so basically, if you've got a set of colleagues the Association of Black Anthropologists of the AAA is the other example I used. You may not know the people in that section, but you can write to them. You don't have to just write to people you already know. We faculty, this is for the faculty in the room, we faculty need to actually start extending our networks because you all know that when you have 10 applicants for every, sex, every space in your program, in your doctoral program, one of the things that counts is who is recommending that person. One of the things that counts is who's vouching for that person. So that means we're actually an exclusionary network. And there's no good way to fix that other than to extend our networks. And it's not actually difficult. And if we say, here's why you should send your undergraduates to us as graduate prospects, because we have these fellowships, because we have these support programs, because we have this record of placement, so you also need to know that information. If you don't know that information for your program, sit down and do it, because you need to know it. Uh, it's, a, it's a segue. OK, so examples. The UC Historically Black Colleges and Universities Initiative. Um, this is, there's a thing on the, or, the UC Office of the President website about this. This basically um, is a summer program that brings students from historically black colleges and universities to any of the UC campuses to engage in research with a, a faculty member. It's much more used in the sciences than in the social sciences, I'm sad to say, partly because in the social sciences we are not on campus in the summer. And this is an on-campus initiative. So I couldn't, for example, ask somebody, ask the university for funding to bring somebody and take them to Mexico with me. That, is illegal. They'd have to stay on campus. My, my field site now is in Mexico. So, But you can try and work up, work with your university for similar kinds of programs that would allow you to engage. And some of us, our field site is in, <laughs> in our own state, I, especially in historical archaeology. You're all, I, I am a member of the SHA, but I don't work in North America. So I should have said that. I shouldn't take for, for granted that you know who I am. Um, the Mellon Mays Undergraduate Fellowship Program is the example of the pipeline program I wanted to use. And again, you should become familiar with it if you're not. Just go to the Mellon Mays, just Google it. You can find that very long. Um, uh, www.mmuf.org will get you there. This is a fabulous program in terms of the fact that it supports students as undergraduates, and then when they're graduates, they are part of the they, they continue to have some support, including travel money, and they become engaged. They're actually working even harder now to engage the graduate students who were undergraduates in the program as mentors of undergraduates, 
and they're trying to put together an alumni network. So this, one of the problems that underrepresented minority students often have in majority departments is there's not enough other students to form a community or a cohort. This is a cohort and it exists at your university already. It crosses interdisciplines. And as an alumni network, the people who are anthropology PhD candidates who came out of the Mellon Mays program can form a support network for each other. So this, this program, this one program, I think, if we just began actually working productively, proactively with it, not just sitting there and waiting until somebody calls us up and says, so we have a Mellon Mays undergraduate, would you be their mentor, which is how I first learned about the program. Um, the, um, the coordinator of the program called me and said, we have this undergraduate and he's interested in this stuff and he proposed somebody else as a mentor, but that doesn't seem like a good mix because what he wants to do is what you do. Because as an undergraduate, as a, a beginning undergraduate, he didn't know where in the university to find somebody who did what he did. Um, okay, comprehensive admissions review. I promised this would be short. It turns out it's not as short as it should be. I will try, but these are very important things. Comprehensive review. When you review people's applications, the number one thing is not to use the GREs to screen people out. Don't use the GREs at all if you can, if you can manage it. The GREs are a cultural test, a test of cultural capital. We, the physics department at Berkeley has done an amazing study, unlike anything else, where they looked at all the students that they had, had come into their program over a long period of time and their subsequent career outcomes, including like Nobel Prizes, and have statistically determined that there is no correlation between the GREs and what happens in your life as a graduate student or postgraduate. Physics, that's physics. How much more so in a social science, right? Pay attention to patterns of improvement in undergraduate achievement, not just the final GPA. Even switching to the GPA can screen out people you want. I have had students as undergraduates at Berkeley who in their first two years tanked because they were from families where they were working 40 hours a week and sending money back to the family because the family couldn't afford not to have their work, not to have their labor. And it was only after they stopped doing that that they were able to put their effort into their, um, their studies. Those first two years on the GPA, pull the GPA down enough. You have to look at the pattern. You have to look at people's transcripts and look at the pattern across the four years. You should do this for all students anyway. But you really can't just screen people from these numerical indices. And look for applicants who have participated in pipeline programs because the pipeline programs prepare them for the, motive, the independent research process for meeting deadlines. They give them some of the cultural capital so they give them a little bit more of an edge, a little bit more of fingers on the ledge. If you want to introduce the idea of comprehensive evaluation of applicants to your university or just your faculty, you can say that Berkeley has been doing this for years. And we have posted on our website the memo that goes out, co-signed by the, the dean of the graduate division and the vice chancellor for equity and inclusion every year that complements, commends departments that have updated their graduate admissions procedures in this direction and basically lays out why not to do this. The GRE board itself endorses comprehensive review. If you've got people in your department who say, well, the GREs are really important for some reason. Lots of people like this number. Test scores should always be used along with other sources of information such as course grades, blah, 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 blah. That's the college board and they have a financial incentive in, in your continuing to use the GREs. One of the things that I have found successful as a micro practice is to say to people, don't use the GREs to, to rule people out. Look at everything else first. And then you can look at the GRE as supporting your opinion that you've already formed in a more holistic way. If you're gonna be a GRE person at all, you can look at it that way. And then I argue against using it at all one-on-one, -on -one. but that's, you know, you can, you can change this culture. It is possible to change it. And finally, so you've gotten these students in because you've actually changed all of this process. You've set up some sort of pipeline. You've actually reached out to people you didn't know before and asked them to refer their students to you personally so you can help them, uh, coach them on how to write an essay to get into your program. Establish clear benchmarks for progress. This is something that um, we, again, comes out of the idea that we need to keep students progressing in a timely fashion so they get their degree within the statistically um, established number of years that goes along with getting into tenure track jobs. 
So you have to have clear outlines of your program's benchmarks. You have to have clear measures of progress that the students understand, and you have to communicate them regularly to students. These should, but I know that most graduate programs have a kind of weird combination of what looks like clear benchmarks and sort of squamous practices. Sit down and write those things out, make the faculty read them, everybody agree to it, put a date on it, and hand it out to students. My, I've reduced ours in the archaeology program to a series of check marks year by year. So there's a checklist, one page, that the student can check as they go. And because they have that, there is no confusion about how much time you should spend on one thing versus another thing in the sequencing. Have formal required consultations of students and faculty at frequent interviews of all students with the faculty. Because again, if you start singling out certain students for extra attention as if they are already failing, you are sending the message that you think of them as not really ready for this whole thing. So you've got to think about how to do this across a program so that you are touching base so that students cannot slip through the cracks. Um, every graduate student deserves a caring mentor assigned on admission that may not be the same person as the prospective dissertation chair. Um, and so don't assume that one faculty member can do this alone. Probably the most radical thing we've done in the archaeology program at Berkeley is we assign every incoming graduate student two co-advisors on entry to the program. So if you have a personality clash with one, you've got somebody else to go to. And that's separate from the graduate advisor for the whole program, which is me. Um, so you really, unless you're unlucky enough that I'm one of your co-advisors, you have three people to go to. So key issues in the persistence of underrepresented minority students, actually this is a study in New Directions for Institutional Research from 2006, actually validates that these kinds of practices are what we should be doing, but it adds these really important interventions. Having adequate financial aid guarantees increases retention of students from non-college families. What does that mean? If you get an offer letter that doesn't make it clear that you can afford this thing, and you don't have savings, and your family doesn't have savings, and you don't have a house to mortgage, and you have never had credit, you are not going to take the risk. You can't take the risk. We know as faculty that there is no risk. Even if you don't have a guarantee, if you get into a doctoral program, something always works out, right? You might be the person who teaches too much. Make your offer letters very, very clear about how you will be funded through the program. And rethink how you're funding people. Because every doctoral student needs some teaching experience. Teaching experience in Berkeley has done studies of this. Teaching experience in the first year does not set people back. I used to think it did. I, I've been convinced by the data. But too much teaching does. In, in our studies, more than six semesters worth of teaching during a doctoral program is correlated with prolonged time to degree. So think about this. And if that means admitting fewer PhD students, admit fewer PhD students. That's also something that we've started doing. Retention also improves with learning communities. First year interest groups, tutoring, mentoring, and student orientation. So your first year, set up a schedule of things that encourage the first year students to form a cohort, to study together, and make certain that those things are not based on opting in. Because based on opting in is, <coughs> creates social barriers. Some students are more comfortable with opting in than other students. The students who maybe have a comfort level with each other may exclude students from non-college going backgrounds, from different ethnic or racial groups, without intending, and you will have a bifurcation from the first year of your program. So create a formal structure for the first year students. We have a two semester introductory course sequence and the students in that, that thing have to work together. And that creates that cohort for them in the first year. Now they may go different ways after that, but to give them a year to get their feet on the ground. So we've got examples of this and I will just leave these to the, um, the I'll make the PowerPoint available. Um, it's really simple, really simple. Develop a pipeline, do the work. Do comprehensive admissions review. Stop your, stop your colleagues. I'm assuming everybody in this room is committed to, comprehensive, for, to the, the goals of comprehensive review. You probably do it already and don't call it something. So change the practices of your colleagues. And mentor for retention and completion. 
put the effort in in the first year, set up these very formal benchmarks, make all the students meet with you on a regular basis, and keep track of your data. Be concerned if you do not improve your performance. If you do all of this and do not improve your performance, ask yourself, what are you doing wrong? Because you're doing something wrong. Okay. And now we're all going to come up here and we're going to have, and we've gotten more people. Yay. No, thank you.